What's up, everyone? Welcome back to a Mile Higher podcast, episode 68. And today we are talking about the haunted Amneville house murders. Did I just say that wrong? Yeah, no, right that, out no, the that gate? was right. That Did was I right. do it right? Okay. <laughs> that has been the biggest thing in this whole research process is, is figuring out exactly how to say Amityville. 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 It's like a silent T, kind of. Sort of, yeah. It, it's it's like, kind of hard to say, Amityville. Amityville. But Amity- I'm sure many of you have heard of this probably from the movie. The Amityville horror. Yes, which I do not partake in such movies personally, but Josh has seen it, and I'm sure many I of have. you have. And there has been a bunch of Amityville movies, uh, which is really interesting about this. But what a lot of people don't understand is it's not just about the haunting that may or may not have occurred at this house Yes. Um, in Amityville, which we New will York. Ex- be exploring the paranormal side of things as well, but... It's also it's a really true a crime true case. crime case. Absolutely. Yeah. This episode is going to be very much a true crime case. Yes. With some paranormal elements to it, for sure. Yes. Um, super interesting stuff. But before we get into today's news topics, I wanted to quickly remind all of you, if you're in the Austin area or in Texas, for that matter, or if you just want to come out and, you know, meet us and see our first live show, we're going to be in Austin at the RTX convention. Yes. July 5th to the 7th. And I just got word that we will be doing sort of a meet and greet panel signing type of thing on Saturday, July 6th from 12 to 1.30, I believe. Nice. And yeah, so you can meet us there and then we'll be doing a live show on Sunday from 3 to 4 p.m., which should be interesting. I mean, who knows how the hell it'll go. But Yeah, this is going to be really out it's of our elements. It's going to be a big challenge for us. Yeah, but come support us because this is like, yeah, like a big challenge for us. Hopefully there'll be Being at least live. like one person there that is like a fan. Hopefully. Oh my gosh, I would hope so. That would be really awkward if no one gave a fuck about us. They're like, get off the stage. Bring the next person <laughs> in. <laughs> well, what's funny is like I saw in the schedule that if any of you out there know who Philip DeFranco is. Yes, Philly he, D. You, you can actually coming. come on Saturday and, you know, meet us and whatever but then you can hang around right after and yes, Philip DeFranco is going to be right after us same place as us same place same time so does that mean we get to meet Philly D we'll be like finishing up our, our like signing and then getting in line to get Philip's <laughs> signature hey, Phil. <laughs> we'll get out of your out of your way man that'll be so cool so we're really excited it's going to be a huge experience for us and we hope many of you will come out and join us so again this is in austin july 5th through the 7th there'll be information in the description box if you're on youtube yep yep we'll put the take a link in the description but let's go ahead and jump into today's uh this week's topics so first one we've got is a very bizarre one human decomposition is now legal i wanted to talk about this specifically this week because this was super interesting to me fascinating actually and i can't believe that we honestly haven't already been doing this for a long time it seems like yeah yeah the kind of seems kind of common sense way. like we would have this already. and i'm i'm sure at many times in our history this is was the standard way of doing things probably i don't know though i think i think we've been burying people in you know caskets and coffins and as well as cremation for as long as time has but gone even on like natives and stuff yeah, I mean, I mean, but they still buried their dead. So this but is different. Probably buried in things that can, they can yeah, decompose well, you it. Ever, well, right. All human bodies decompose, right? At some point. Well, not if you're like embalmed and in a little box. True, true. That is true. It's creepy thinking about what you'd look like after a hundred years. It is. Like, I just don't like that. I like this so much better. So let's tell you guys what this is. Cause some of you are probably like, wait, what? So where is it legal? What's going on with this? So Washington has become the first state in the united states to legalize the composting of human remains which offers people a more eco-friendly alternative to traditional burial or cremation that's what this is really about is like eco-friendly right this is the eco-friendly way to you know bury or you know say goodbye to a loved one or yeah rather than like because cremation requires energy there's right you know co2 from the furnaces things like that releases Mm -hmm. right you still produce some sort of pollution from that and then not obviously green putting people in boxes that just or caskets or whatever else people are buried with into the ground yeah, yeah. you're kind of leaving them i mean you're preserving that person or like you know cemeteries things like that whereas what this is basically going to do is allow you to you know once you pass away your ba- your body is placed in a module filled with organic matter so like wood chips and straw yeah 
um, which help reduce the moisture content of the body mm -hmm. to about 65%. And then they're going to use alfalfa as an activator, which provides nitrogen and protein to speed up the breakdown process. So they're going to use natural elements to speed up the decomposition yes. process mm -hmm. so that everything, including bones and teeth, turns into compost. Within like four weeks, That's right? what's crazy about this. The time's it's really quick. A 30, 30 days. days. Yeah, like four weeks. It's bro so you're put into a steel container for 30 days. Kind of like if you, if any of you out there compost, you know, like composting bins. Yeah. It's like a human composting bin. Yeah. That you're put into. Well, yeah. kind of makes sense. Yeah. I love the idea of this. I love the idea of like going back to the earth. This is how I'm going to, I'm going to go. I've already decided. I really like this. Write it in the will right now. Kendall would <laughs> like to be composted. I like this because Note taken. here's the cool thing about it. After the four weeks or the 30 days or whatever, you get to pick up your loved ones, like giant bed of soil. Yeah. It's just dry, straight fluffy. up soil that you can then take to your house and plant like a bunch of flowers in it or something. And I think that's so sweet that you can go out versus having to go to like a graveyard and just sit, a, sit like when you know that they're just in a box under the ground. That's kind of weird to me. I like that this is like they're part, they literally become part of your earth. And then the, the yeah. flowers are, they're growing through the flowers. And I think it's such a beautiful thing. And I think more states are going to follow Washington on this, and this is going to become a really oh, popular yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. I bet you Colorado will be one of the next people. I can just, just because see it, it seems like Washington, like Cal probably California, Colorado. But wouldn't that be crazy if you're like over at someone's house and they're like, oh, yeah, this is my grandma. Like it's a flower bed now, but <laughs> or it was they just my had grandma. a composting bin outside and they're dead loved ones in it. That's kind of weird. Oh, that's I don't know weird. if you'll have the bin. No, I don't, you don't have the bin. It's pit. a facility. Yes, yeah. You pick it up from the facility, the, um, the soil thing. Yeah. It's the like actual big, company you can choose. I was reading, you can choose to get like a small amount of the soil to just have like a pot of it, or you can get the entire thing. Um, all of it. Yeah. Which makes sense. But I kind of like that idea better. Cause if you think about ashes, like what do you do with ashes? You, it's, you, you can't really do anything with it other than just like sprinkle them out and there they go. Yeah. You know? Which I mean, I understand why people Versus do this it stays put, but it's also part of the ground and part of the earth. And it's like recycling ourselves. It's I just like love that. Life I, hate reborn. I, I really don't like the idea of being cremated for some reason, but I even more don't like the idea of being buried in a casket. So this is the first option I've heard that I'm like, Oh, I could get behind this. Like, I like this. It's I'm a great, die this way in the middle of the road type. Bear, like yes. end of life thing because if you think yes, about it, it's it like is. would i rather be six feet under <laughs> or <laughs> would i rather be scattered to the winds to who knows where yeah. my ashes go plus the idea of That's my body being too, though that'd be my second choice but the idea of my body being put into a furnace yeah where it's that's where like, I, that's really <gasps> it, i like, can't even think about it it bothers me so much oh sorry yeah, i'm live no. streaming <laughs> yeah <laughs> for no, those that, of you who uh don't know i live stream on the instagram on mile higher podcast we live stream the intro topics on there. Sorry. But anyway. No, I like that idea. I'm with you. Let's do it together. <laughs> I'd say we both will tell our kids. We'll be like, kids, when mm -hmm. we when we go, yes. you need to compost us together. Well, keep, what if keep, we're five years apart? That's or fine. Keep us alive. Or not keep us alive. <laughs> keep us alive. No, put us in a cryo tank. Put us in the cryo. No. Cryonic, mm -hmm. Freeze us. I'm going to be like, put me in the ground right away. Us. And when your dad's ready, jo have him Plant join me. Plant a tree me. next to him. <laughs> yeah. Would you two want to beds, be? two beds of flowers next to each other? It would be cool though. That yeah. like the succulent garden right here is made yeah. up of soil from my loved yeah, one. Yeah, because then you're absorbing like nutrients from the body into the plants, and it's. I think it's really it's beautiful. Li it's like kind of I don't know. The it's circle life, of life reborn. It's, it's it's creating life from death. Yeah, it's really cool. I think it's really cool. It's very cool. So yeah, that was really interesting. And then the other thing a lot of you guys were tweeting us about. Yes. Um, that was pretty big honestly nasa so they put out a new video on youtube and it's got 10 million plus views it's called we are going and it's about what essentially what the hell has nasa been up to for one we haven't seen really much from them in a long time and obviously we haven't been to the moon we haven't really been doing anything space wise um in a long time so nasa put out this video and we're going to go in and play it just because it's it's a couple minutes long, but it's really interesting and it gives you a good idea of, of where things are, are headed with NASA. 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science 
and showed us all what was possible. It's very pretty out here. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The Moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. Hell fucking All yeah, right. dude. I am going. <laughs> How are you? I'm oh, signing man. up. Well, it's really interesting. There goes the whole, they've never gone to the moon thing. <laughs> I wonder if they're like, we've been getting a lot of shit about not going to the moon in a really long time. We better get our asses up there. Yeah, well, Just I think yeah, that kidding. could be part of it, but. It is kind of funny. The main thing was honestly that kind of kickstarted this is Trump. Like this really? is one, one thing that I really am like, yay for good job Trump. Like for taking the space seriously, like NASA. Yeah, that's that is kind true. Kind of like he he came out and was like, we need to be back on the moon. We got to you know kind of take control of space a little bit because mm -hmm. that's literally where I I the think future is going. Yeah, yeah, that's where like the next frontier is for civilization, I, I believe. And and from this so. The, the short summary is basically they're going to the moon by 2024 and they're going to stay there. They're going to build build a colony, a base on the moon, which they'll be in for, you know, a while while they get that set up. And then eventually by the 2030s, they said, go to Mars and beyond with uh, the help of that gateway station. Yeah. So, so is Elon Musk planning to get there before them? Isn't he planning to go like even sooner? 
Yeah, I don't know. That's the thing. That's what's so weird about is what are all these? I mean, I guess these private space companies are going to be doing their own thing, too, Mm -hmm. as well as other countries. Obviously, I'm sure like China and some of these, you know, Russia, places like that are are gearing up there. I mean, it's going to be really interesting, I think, in the next 10 to 30 years or so to see what happens with space and see, you know, if all this comes to fruition and like we actually see that would be to watch that. Like imagine like in 20 years being able to like flip on the TV and you're watching a live stream of astronauts on the moon in their colony or something or or you're able to see a live stream of people on Mars in their colony. But it really does seem like and we've talked about this over and over in the past couple of weeks because it seems like it's really ramping up this idea of space colonization and yeah. missions into deep space and beyond. Like Yeah. We're, we're and the really reason like behind going. it seems to like build a new frontier like that's that seems like what they're doing. And, and that's like what the conversation around it seems to be like to propel us into the future to get to Mars. You know, it's a launching point between Mars. So, mm-hmm. God, I really I don't think Mar- I don't understand the whole Mars thing, though, because. Mars is way worse than Earth. Like, yeah. why? Why try to re like make Mars livable when the Earth we should be working on fixing our own planet, too? Right. I mean, yeah, that's it's a valid like, argument. It is. A, it's a valid argument for sure. Because, yeah, I mean, Mars, we're going to have to like terraform and stuff. We're going to have to artificially yeah. colonize it because there's no no atmosphere. Yeah. It's barren wasteland there. Mm-hmm. We might have to do the same thing they're doing on Mars, like extracting the water, separating oxygen, getting oxygen out. It's a whole like they could, might have to steam all the water out of the soil. It's like it's so over the top versus we could just fix our perfect fucking planet we have mm-hmm. and just make sure that stays working. For right, years or to it's come. beyond repair, and they know that. But I feel like Mars is worse beyond repair. <laughs> like, chances are, Mars was lived on at one point, and there was some type of nuclear incident or war or something, major impact from space, something like that. And there's a reason why. I mean, they there's proof that there's, like, radiation and stuff mm-hmm. in Mars. Like, mm-hmm. so why would we want to go live on Mars? I think it's, I think when they talk about Mars, it's it's more of, like, pushing humanity forward. It's like a big step for mankind to, yeah, to prove but it sounds that they to me can like do that. They're like looking towards for somewhere to yeah. live. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, not only I think that, the but tube that what's his face came up with Jeff, Jeff Bezos. Bezos? Yeah. 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 The live in the big tube thing mm-hmm. that I feel like would be better than trying to rehab Mars. Mars looks pretty fucking bad to me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not going to live on Mars. Yeah, I don't know exactly what they're going to do with Mars. I mean, for I all think we, Arizona's hot. Well, for all we know, there could be a completely livable area within it. Have you ever thought about the possibility of like a hollow planet? Like, what if there's a yeah. planet that has a totally well, another? That's a whole nother story. No, I know, uh, but I'm just saying, like, even Mars could have something underneath yeah. the surface. Like, we know there's water. There's a lot of people it. that think that there's like a whole civilization of people that live in Mars that at one point lived on top of the surface, but have gone inside. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's pretty interesting True. stuff. Maybe we're, we're going to back to link up with them. Maybe. <laughs> link up. <laughs> hey guys, what's up? It's been, been a while. Long time. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting though. I, I actually. What do you think of the have video? A bit like of faith. And now, I mean, it's a great video. I, I get why t- it's got so many views. It's, I mean, I think it, all of us have been wondering, like, what the hell has NASA been doing? I just feel like there's such a secrecy with NASA. Like, we just get kind of bullshit partial answers story. on stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we probably do. I mean, there's probably that more video reasons. Felt so scripted and fake and like. Well, yeah. I would have appreciated more of like a check out what we're doing, like behind the scenes look, just like wa- a dude walking around showing us. But it's like this whole. That almost felt like a political campaign. Oh, I, I think it is. And I think it's a stunt to try to like increase their, you know, their good image, you know, or improve their image yeah. to the world. Cause I think they have been getting shit on lately. And especially since conspiracies yeah. has kind of come back into, you know, popular oh, totally. society, uh-huh. a lot of people are starting to look at the NASA yeah. conspiracies. Say, and what's up? Why haven't we gone to the moon since the like, 70s? Dude, yeah, exactly. 73, right? Why has it been so fucking long? Why has it been years 70, and years and 73? years? 73? Yeah. It's been yeah. It's been a time. long time that we haven't done it shit and yeah. we haven't even been to the other side of the moon. Like what the hell? Yeah. So, well, that'll be interesting to watch for sure. Yeah, it definitely will be. So good old NASA, but let's go ahead and get into the Amityville murders first. Yes. But before we do I want to thank our sponsors for today. 
This episode is brought to you by Quip, which is one of our favorite sponsors of all time. Quip is truly one of Josh and I's favorite products that we have found in the past year. It really modernizes the toothbrush. Now, I have never thought a toothbrush could be anything decorative or something cute in your bathroom, but I was wrong. Quip has a really sleek, stylish design. It it really looks like the toothbrush of the future. And the case is really unique and compact. You can take the toothbrush, put it in the case and take it with you to go, or you can actually stick the case to the mirror, which I don't even understand. This thing never gets unsticky and it doesn't leave any sticky residue on your mirror and it only sticks to mirrors. I don't understand it, but it's amazing. Another thing that we love about Quip is that it has a two minute timer. Now, I bet you anything you are not brushing your teeth for two minutes. I definitely wasn't until I actually started using the timer on the Quip toothbrush and it basically vibrates to let you know to switch into a different section of your mouth. It breaks your mouth into four different quadrants so that you get every single area. Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association, and they're backed by over 25,000 dental professionals. They have thousands of verified five-star reviews, and now Quip has a kid's brush. It's the same as their old version, just tweaked for smaller mouths. And this will help kids inspire to brush better and improve their oral hygiene habits, which helps them develop a grown-up routine without the childish gimmicks. So we love Quip. There are over 1 million happy, healthy mouths that do too. Quip starts at just 25 bucks. And if you go to quip.com slash mile higher right now, you can get your first refill pack for free. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash mile higher, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P.com slash mile higher today. So if you're like me, you probably deal with stress and anxiety, probably on a daily basis. I mean, I know I do, and it can be oftentimes hard to just deal with it and find a way to alleviate that stress. You know, with all the things that are going on in this world right now and how crazy everything is, it can be really hard to even just sleep at night. So what can you actually do to help alleviate that stress, help you sleep better, as well as help with your anxiety? Well, today I'm here to tell you that we are partnering with Calm, the number one app to help you reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. More than 40 million people around the world have downloaded it already. If you head to calm.com slash mile higher, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription. And what's really cool about your subscription is it includes a lot of different things like guided meditations on issues like stress, anxiety, and focus, as well as a brand new meditation for you every single day. There's also one of my favorite things called sleep stories, which are literally bedtime stories for adults designed to just help you relax. Right now, Mile High listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash mile higher. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash mile higher. Get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today at calm.com slash mile higher. The first part of this true crime paranormal topic we're going to start with is the murders because that's what happened first. So the Amityville Mm -hmm. murders is really the most terrifying thing about this house. Um, That's supposed to be one of a lot of people consider it the most haunted house in America. Um, It's, it's tons of tourists still to this day yeah. that go to this house because of just how famous it is, really. I mean, the amount of movies and stuff that have been made about it and books and things like that, right. which we'll talk about, is actually really crazy. So, And I mean, even like I had heard of it, even though I really yeah. just hate scary movies. It's so interesting. I am not at all afraid to watch like a documentary on this or to learn about the truth about it or real murders don't scare me. But I really just don't like horror movies. I don't yeah, like I to say, see it acted out a little bit. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, I and I didn't even want to watch it for this because I didn't want it, it to get in like confused in my head with the real story. I like to focus on real stuff. I don't like over dramatized fake things and I don't enjoy being scared. I don't like the idea <laughs> of like things popping out and scaring me. Like, I don't like that feeling of jumping and yeah, like a sure. lot of people like that. It just gives me anxiety. Yeah, I'm an anxiety riddled mess all during scary movies. It's not a fun experience for me. So I don't really watch them, but documentaries like crime documentaries don't don't scare me at all. It just is so interesting to me. I don't know. A lot of people don't understand that, but I've watched like maybe three scary movies in my whole life. Anyway. Yeah. So me, on the other hand, I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum. (laughs) So I have always liked scary movies. I've liked especially paranormal movies. 
which is really funny because I grew up obviously in a very religious household and I was taught that like demons and spirits and ghosts and everything were literally straight from hell. Like, yeah, like this was Satan's work. Well, Honestly, dude, I feel like a lot of religious people end up being interested in these types of movies or yeah. like them yeah, later totally. on in their life because they're like banned as a kid. So it's like, Ooh, right. Scary. No, that's exactly what it is. Cause I was banned from watching any sort of scary movie until uh, one of my friends came along who was like a horror junkie. And he started exposing me to all, like I've watched so many horror movies. Like, I remember one of the first ones I ever saw was Texas Chainsaw. Oh, I will never that watch one was that fucking, type of thing. That one blew my mind. So but anyways, scary. back to Amityville. So yeah, I watched the Amityville horror, the the original one. I've watched the remakes. The original one I think is still the better one in my opinion. But Amityville is actually a town 30 miles outside of New York City. And it's nestled in the Long Island area. And there's the house there that is extremely famous, also known as the Amityville house. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the house, I mean, it looks like just a normal ass New England style house, right? It's Dutch architecture, hence the windows. And yeah, it's just backs up to like a Creek river thing with a boat house behind it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks like a pretty, pretty normal house. Yeah. So these murders that occur at the Amityville house had to do with a family named the DeFeos. So the DeFeo family consisted of Ronald Joseph DeFeo senior who was the dad and he was born on November 16th, 1930. And then his wife was Louise uh, Brigante, who was born on November 3rd, 1931. So a little back uh, backstory on those two, because I think it's important to understand the whole family dynamic here. So after the, um, actually he went by a nickname called Big Ronnie, because in this story there's Ronald DeFeo Sr. and Ronald DeFeo Jr. And it gets kind of confusing if I refer to them as by their real name. So we'll go by their nickname. So big Ronnie is dad. And then as you'll, I'll talk about in a minute, butch is Ronald little Ronnie. DeFeo. Yeah. There you go. Or just little big Ronnie, little Ronnie. So big Ronnie and Luis got married. And from the very beginning, Luis's parents always disproved of uh, big Ronnie. And after they got married, um, they had their son, Ronald Joseph DeFeo jr. Or butch. On September 26, 1951. Now, Butch is the main uh, person in this story. So, Butch, growing up, had it hard. He was the firstborn and a boy, and his father expected more from him. And Big Ronnie was not afraid to discipline Butch in the cruelest fashion. Literally, from a young age, abused. Mm -hmm. Um, Really sad, honestly. Um, Like many killers. Exactly. One minute he would hug his son, the next minute we'd throw him across the room. Luis's brother, Michael Brigante Jr., would later testify at the trial about an incident he witnessed when Butch was just two years old. He said, we were all sitting down in the basement watching TV, and I don't know. The boy had done something, and all of a sudden, he stood up, uh, Big Ronnie, the dad, and just pushed the boy into the wall. And the boy banged his head or part of his shoulder on something. God. At two years old. For all we know, I mean, he could have gave Butch like brain damage, dude. Like, yeah, he could have honestly some type of brain like, injury. It'd be interesting. Like that's one thing we've talked about too is like being able to TBI. look inside the mind of these killers and things like that and yeah. see if they have actual brain damage. Some of them do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as a child, Butch was extremely overweight and would remain so until his later teenage years when he began using amphetamine. So drugs were a big part of his life. Um, from a young age, he was experimenting with drugs, and he was bullied a lot. He was made fun of because he was a bigger kid. People would call him the blob, Bucky Beaver, and Pork Chop. God. Kids are so fucking mean. They are. Bullying is just so terrible on a child. Like, it just fucks you up. Yeah, it really does. No matter does. who you are, it has an impact on you. Yeah, it really does. And it, and it can take so you one or two ways. it's so to you at that age. It's like... You, well, it's your whole world, yeah, right? It's yeah. your school and your friends. So, yeah. if that part is fucked up, then yeah, it's extremely hard. So Butch wasn't the only child for long. On June 29, 1956, Luis gave birth to a daughter, Dawn Teresa DeFeo. And then a few years later, on August 16, 1961, Luis gave birth to Allison Luis DeFeo. And then again on September 4, 1962, to Mark DeFeo. Getting busy. <laughs> so one of the things and part of the reason why I think they had so many kids too is so growing up, they were had that abusive childhood. But as mm-hmm. they went on and when they moved to this house especially they became catholic yes they got religious right 
And a lot of Catholic families are big. Yes. Oh, definitely. Because a lot of them don't believe in birth control. Right, right, right. So could be one of the reasons why the, the family got as big as it did. So how many members of they had five? Mm-hmm. Five. Okay. So after the birth of Mark, Louise decided to leave her husband for reasons that remain unclear. And in order to get his wife back, Big Ronnie decided to put his writing talents to good use. And needing to express his love for his wife, Big Ronnie co-wrote a song called The Real Thing. In 1963, Joe Williams, the jazz great, recorded the song for his album title, One is a Lonesome Number. That's actually kind of a cool fact. Interesting. But yeah, I guess that won her back. Oh, she came back? So he was probably abusive to her. Like, he's an abusive dude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even in this picture of him, look at him pouring the liquor. I bet he was a drinker. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure he wasn't nice to her. That's probably the reason why she left. A lot of women will come yeah. back to some s- sappy it's like fucking like shit like Jack that. It's like kind of like Jack from song. This Is Us's childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, his dad's a drunk and stuff. Mm-hmm. So then on October 24th, 1965, Big Ronnie was blessed with a third son, John Matthew DeFeo. And by this time, the family had moved from their Bro- Brooklyn apartment to the affluent Long Island South Shore community of Amityville. And for many, it was a mystery how Big Ronnie could afford such a lavish home on a car dealer's service manager's salary. Yeah, how did he do that? That's really interesting, and she didn't work at all. Well, what we find out is he was a part of, like, a large criminal syndicate. His car dealership was. So who knows? I mean, and who knows what other, like, illegal shit was going on there. Yeah. But he obviously was making good money somehow. Mm And in the early 1970s, Big Ronnie decided he wanted a series of life-size portraits created to immortalize his family. <sighs> so weird. Isn't that weird that when so people weird. do that? Yeah. Have you ever been to a house and somebody has just like a giant like picture of themselves on the wall? Not not of themselves, but I know people do it. Or I have just like, saw, um, who did I saw? I saw Trisha Paytas' house in one of Chris <laughs> Clemens' videos, and she had pictures of herself all over the whole house. Some people are into that. Which, I mean, whatever, if you want whatever to do that. Whatever floats your boat. Cool. Yeah. I would feel really weird. With I would be like, really, I'd just want to hide them. I'd want to like throw blankets on it. Never see them again. <laughs> be weird. Wouldn't it be weird to have a giant picture of yourself? It would just bother me every time I'd that. walk by it. I'd be like, ugh, that. I don't want to see my, Yeah, I don't want to see that. I'm so cringe. <laughs> I already got to look at myself in the mirror, all right? I don't want to <laughs> look at myself on my wall, too. What the hell? But one of the other reasons that... um Ronnie had some money is because of his father-in-law actually right. Luis's mother mm-hmm. um, they had money as well and they, he actually paid for these portraits for them Interesting. 50 grand that's so estimated insane. to be at least 50 grand. 50 grand for the portraits yeah for life-size portraits which they hung in huge golden frames on the staircase wall in between the first and second floors of their home that is Big so strange asking. to want to do that to spend 50 fucking g's on family portraits right that's so so were they painted? They must have been hand painted. For fifty grand, they yeah. Better it's not a, have been. <laughs> it's not like a little shitty like camera picture, yeah. like with film. <laughs> no, it better have go. been a Yeah, painting. it was life size portrait, I'm assuming paintings, yeah. Like, that's just so weird. That's like what they did in the way olden days. Like, why do you need to do that now? They must feel dumb that they spent well Speaking of people painting on the walls, my grandpa is this a ridiculously insane picture of Napoleon on his wall. Of Napoleon? Yeah, it's literally like wall painting? to ceiling, dude. It's huge. Ew, why it's does like, he have Napoleon? He's such a shit person. No. Your but, grandpa's yeah, so weird. He's funny, man. Yeah, he would have Napoleon <laughs> he on the wall. He fucking would. Right? It doesn't surprise I just thought that me, was funny. So let's go ahead and get into the day that this literal massacre goes down. It's, it's just wild what happens here. So in the early evening hours of November 13th, 1974, the patrons of Henry's bar, a tavern located at the corner of Merrick road and ocean Avenue, ocean Avenue. Oh, don't want to get covered. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yellow else. card. Anybody else like that song, by the way? I love that song. Oh, good song, which that's what Amityville's off ocean Avenue. Mm-hmm. So at this tavern, they're sipping beers, cocktails. Everything is seemingly just a typical evening at this local bar, calm and uneventful, as he said. But by the night's end, this shit gets flipped upside down because of what happens next. At 6.30 p.m., Ronald DeFeo Jr., known by the locals as Butch, opened the door to the bar and yelled, 
You got to help me. I think my mother and father are shot. One of the patrons seated at the bar was Robert or Bobby, an out of work brick mason and Butch's best friend. Bobby raced to his friend who had fallen to his knees, crying hysterically. Butch again pleaded for help. Bobby, you got to help me. Somebody shot my mother and father. Are you sure they're not asleep? No, I saw them up there. Come on, let's go. So literally, Butch is like, he comes in, he's frantic. He's like, guys, we got to go. Gets his six friends to go with him. Uh, John, Joey, Al, William gets like the bar owner and they all pile into Butch's blue Buick Electra and they drive down to his house, which his house was literally only a block away. So he goes over there, gets his friends, drive a block away and they're driving extremely fast. People are yelling at him to slow down and eventually a few seconds later, they arrive at 112 Ocean Avenue. And again, this residence is pretty big. It's a three story colonial home built in 1925 Damn, the property is, is old yeah it's it's extremely old and it's a big it's a really big property but like i mentioned earlier one of the most distinguishable parts of the house is the dramatic looking like uh windows on the front which kind of look like eyes and actually in the movie they like there's always like flashes of light or lightning or like stuff going on inside the house through the the front windows because it looks like eyes are like kind of like blinking but anyway, they pull up in their car, they hop out, they climb the porch and his, his friend Bobby's like yelling, I'm like, be careful, Butch, like you don't know who's in there, right? Because yeah. if somebody's been shot, like why would you come rushing come, into the yeah. house and immediately start like running upstairs if you think somebody came in there and killed him, right? Yeah, you would be more cautious for sure. Mm-hmm. And he's not, he's not doing that. He's like running right in there and... The house was ex- ex- was sorry. The house was quiet, except for their dog Shaggy, who was barking, but he was tied up inside of the kitchen's back door. So the interior of the Devale home was just as impressive as the exterior. To the right of the marble-covered foyer was the formal dining room with red velvet textured wallpaper lining the walls, and in the center of the room, over the Dutch-style table seating six, hung a crystal chandelier. Just a beautiful house inside, um, which is interesting because it. For a car salesman, like he got not only got this big house, yeah. but the inside's like lit. lit it's yeah. like furnished to sh- like. Yeah, he was feeling fancy for sure. This fifty thousand dollar portraits too. It's fancy in there. Yeah, regal. It, yeah, regal. That's the right word for it. They even had a baby grand piano. Oh, very <laughs> regal. You a large fireplace with a pair of satin cushion chairs, lavish paintings, and statues were oh, scattered throughout wow. the room. They literally got the most expensive items for their house. Which again, we're like, how did they get all that yeah. money? Mm. <laughs> Must have been up to. So with Bobby in the lead, the five men hurried up the stairs to the second floor. Bobby was a regular visitor to the DeFeo household and knew exactly where the master bedroom was located. As they reached the second floor, they were overwhelmed with the stench of death. Bobby stopped at the doorway to the master bedroom and hit the light switch. Before him lay DeFeo Sr.'s bare back was the first indication the couple was not, or a hole, I'm sorry, a hole in the center of his back was the first indication the couple was not sleeping. And there was obviously blood trickling out of the wound still. Um, so yeah, there's, there is photos of it. I'm not going to put it in there, but I'll link it for you guys. So you guys, if you want to go see what the crime scene photos looked like, they're pretty, pretty, uh, yeah, graphic. But in contrast to big Ronnie, Luis DeFeo's wounds were not clearly noticeable because her body was buried beneath an orange blanket as if she was protecting herself against the evening chill. Wow. In bed. Just sitting there having no idea. Or sleeping, probably sleeping. Right. Seeing that Bobby was ready to pass out, the other men led him downstairs past the life-size portraits of the family. John remained on the second floor and checked out the northeast bedroom, which was one of the boys' rooms. And there was toys and obviously all the normal stuff in their rooms. And there was also several statues and figurines that were, you know, you commonly find inside of a Catholic home. Mm. You know, a lot of times you'll see like, like Jesus yeah, or, little, you know, saints or yep. Mary or, tree, you know, just different yeah, things like that. Your grandparents have a ton of that. Crosses There's, on the wall mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. And on opposite sides of this room lay the bodies of two young boys face down like their parents. In the bed on the left lay the body of John DeFeo, who was nine years old at the wow, time. Only nine. That's crazy. Yeah. And when John looked at him, he couldn't pinpoint 
the bullet hole in the boy's back since his sweatshirt was completely soaked in blood. Damn. And in the other bed lay his brother, Mark DeFeo, who was 12 years old at the time. That's so young. Mm-hmm. Brutal. One single bullet hole in the center of his back, just like his brother. Wow. So obviously walking into that is like, holy shit, that's yeah. terrifying. Mm-hmm. And really so dark. Yeah. Just, I mean, I can't even imagine walking into a scene like that. Like, I know it would feel really strange being around two young children's bodies like that. Just, I mean, to be in the presence of anybody that's passed is yeah. always just bizarre, especially murder. But like yeah, in we've the- been in, you know, with someone who's passed, but we've never been around someone who's been murdered. Right. No, like yeah, that's yeah. a whole different Oof, feeling. I man. feel like, you know, I mean, not that I would know, but if any of you have ever been around someone who has been recently murdered, let us know. I'm sure some of you for your job or something have had to do it. It's yeah. probably crazy feeling. I'm sure there's a cop or somebody out there that has definitely experienced that. And I'm sure it's very weird. And, and honestly, any blood spatter analysis, people out here, any Dexters? Well, we don't want a Dexter, <laughs> but a blood spatter analysis. Sure. That'd be interesting. I've always yeah. wanted someone like oh, that to come on the pod. person. Yes. Wouldn't that be an interesting guest? Yeah. Those are all great guests. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. So back to the story. John is after just walking to the scene, runs back downstairs to rejoin the others and is, and is like, dude, we gotta, we gotta call 911. Like this is, this is really bad. So their friend Joe called 911, giving details to an emergency uh, dispatcher. And when the police arrived, Butch was immediately taken to the local police station for his own protection, actually. Because he basically suggested to police officers at the scene that the killings had been carried out by a mob hitman uh, named so, Louis mm, Fellini. Mm-hmm. So they started thinking Fellini. maybe it was like someone going after the whole family. So he had to be protected. Well, if you're a police officer and you roll into that scene, yeah, they were all killed with precision and just like all mm-hmm. the same way execution style. So Seemed kind of mobbish, right? Totally. Plus this family, like look at their house. They kind of look like a mob family. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. With true. these giant pictures. And I mean, it sounds from what you're saying. Very true. Like, it must've been a very believable experience or yeah. scene. And just, yeah, as far as Butch's demeanor and everything, they must've bought that story. Right. Cause like they couldn't have been that dumb that they wouldn't have suspected him immediately mm-hmm. if they didn't really feel convinced that it was some type of mob uh, murder or murder for hire or something like that. Mm-hmm. So after Butch is taken uh, to the station, he's given an interview and when he starts, you know, going over his story, that's when the police notice major inconsistencies uh, of his retelling of events. And so the following day he actually confesses after police grill him for a while and some people, and you know, he kind of came out in his defense, like he was coerced, uh, coerced into giving a confession. Like they grilled him hard. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I think they, you know, after looking into it a little bit and figuring out that this Lewis, uh, Lewis guy, the mob guy had an alibi, right? He had yeah. an alibi. So as soon as you find out somebody's got like a legitimate verified yeah. alibi, then they're off. Right. So they grilled him and Butch ended up giving, you know, giving a confession and said, yeah, he carried out the killings himself on his own Mm -hmm. fucking family. Brutal killings, too. And what he actually said, quote unquote, to detectives was once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Honestly, I bet it did. Like, can you imagine being in? I mean, obviously, we would never in a state of rage kill our whole family, right. but everyone's experienced like rage or anger where you may say something really mean to someone or you you do things that you like can't control your own brain when you're really, really angry or heated or, you know, so I can see how it would all like you do one and then you just do the no- other and you just spiral out of control and happen really fast. And you'd almost be like, holy shit, what did I just do? Um I mean, not that it excuses it by any means. And obviously a normal person can stop themselves from ever getting to that point. But yeah, no, I know you're, that makes I bet he really meant it that it happened really fast and I'm sure it did. Yeah. I think in any type of situation like that, where your adrenaline is just like through the roof and, and then he's sitting there like, how long are you going to be able to hide that? I mean, it's traumatic to go through shooting your whole family. Like, how long is he going to be able to keep up the act that he didn't do this? Right. Exactly. You I know? mean, how cold and 
heartless can you possibly be? Like, Which he was pretty fucking cold and heartless soulless, and yeah. angry. And mm-hmm. I'm sure it started with anger towards his dad. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he had anger at all of them, obviously, but it, it must stem back to the abusive relationship he had with his oh, dad. Absolutely. I think and then he just kind of punished everyone else. Maybe he was mad at his mom for not standing up for him enough or, or coming back to him. Maybe she finally left him, you know, and then came back just cause he wrote this song. Plenty of reasons to be angry with your whole family. Absolutely. So a sounds lot like of they valid, had a really yeah. toxic life living all together. So like the other side of this is, you know, sort of the argument that gets brought up is could there have been a paranormal aspect to him, could he have been him taken over? getting to this point, like in the movie being possessed into doing these things hmm. or some, you know, some type of energy in the house that, that literally changes a, a normal person into a savage psycho killer. You know, is there something like that at play? Yeah. But when you start looking at that, you're like, what evidence for that is there? Yeah. And there isn't any. I mean, because like you just said, there's tons of valid reasons why he he would do this. Yeah. He and he seemed this. to have just no remorse. Like it says right here, he after right afterwards, he took a bath right away. Took a bath. I can't imagine like chilling in a bath after doing that. And then he redressed. Changed his then, clothes and yeah, got rid of the murder uh, weapon. Wow. Wow. Which was a 35 Marlin rifle. And he actually hid it out in, I believe, like the boathouse area. So it wasn't even like he tried that hard to hide mm-hmm. everything. And then he told him where his bloody clothes were and stuff. Huh. And so they had a full confession. And at around 3.15 a.m. on November 13th, Bush DeFeo woke up. And for reasons that may be forever unclear, he did those deeds. And then. What time? 3.15 a.m. is when it took He place. just randomly woke up and did it? That's what he says, yeah. So that's really crazy to think about because that, that sounds even more like a haunting or some type of like possession to just wake up and then kill your whole family. That seems kind of odd. Like normally there'd be an altercation or... That's, like, that's like the story though. And then after, yeah, I don't know. Wow what makes you know what causes somebody to do that yeah but then again like we have to remember this guy was doing tons of drugs like he was like dr- either drug drunk or doing some type of drugs but he was on heroin too weird to go to sleep and then wake up and then want to kill everyone that's true but I, do you believe that you believe nah, he just woke not. up i don't really know i mean he changed the story a for lot. all we know he could have been like fucked up and yeah woke up we or whatever. really don't know that's the thing about this case is at the end of the day no one knows exactly what happened in that house that night and it's just never gonna <laughs> we're never gonna know what really happened well we <laughs> do know because the person that did it said they did it yeah but we but don't we know don't exactly know who's involved or, right. with their mayor they may have totally. been two or even three people involved we don't know what time it happened or if there was an altercation beforehand, if the people were forced to lay down or if they were just sleeping in their beds, we don't know all that. We don't know for sure. We know based upon what Butch says, which he gives, a, he gives which another confession he's later. not a reliable person though. Right. To count no, on. absolutely. Like, so we absolutely. really don't know. Absolutely. Because he does change his story till like current day. Like he yeah. changes it constantly. Yep. So we really don't know the real story here. It's almost a game for him to just change right. it. Mm-hmm. So when he gave his original fesh, uh, confession, he was charged, and then his trial actually began on October 14th, 1975. Him and his defense lawyer named <coughs> William Weber mounted an affirmative defense of insanity, with Butch claiming that he killed his family in self-defense because he heard their voices plotting against him. That was another thing, too, is he did report, like, hearing voices. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And the insanity plea was actually supported by the psychiatrist for the defense, Dr. Daniel Schwartz. However, the psychiatrist for the prosecution, Dr. Harold Zolan, maintained Mm -hmm. that although Butch was an abuser of heroin and somehow an abuser of LSD, he had antisocial personality disorder and was aware of his actions at the time of the crime. Mm -hmm. So one found the defense found him insane and the other one said he was kind of insane and fucked up, but knew what he was doing. Yeah. And just on drugs. Yeah. How convenient each side has their own <laughs> psychologist yeah. to say whatever. Yeah. That's true. And how different they come out mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Just shows you like it's all, I think it's I all know. like 
what you perceive, you know, it's all yeah. one person. A lot of the times it comes down to someone's professional opinion, which can vary from person to person, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's kind of wild, honestly. And after a lengthy trial, which concluded right before Thanksgiving, Butch DeFeo was found guilty of six second degree murder counts for killing his mother, father, two brothers, and two sisters. God. That's wild. And then shortly thereafter, on December 4th, 1975, Judge Thomas Stark sentenced uh, Butch to six concurrent sentences of 25 years to life. Basically, no chance of getting released. Yeah, they came down on him hard. Yeah. I mean, he killed four people. As far as we know, yeah. As far as we know, he committed six six, murders. Yeah. yeah. So no other suspect was prosecuted ever for the crime. And officially, he is what we believe to be the person that committed these crimes to this day. Although the actual evidence itself points to a conspiracy. So more than one person conspiring to kill, actually. The court had determined that DeFeo had acted alone, killing all six members of his family with a 35 gauge Marlin rifle. However, Butch had supposedly shot each victim as they slept and both prosecution and defense agreed he had not used a silencer. What's crazy about this is how does one person do this alone without waking up his family because you can't obviously shoot everybody all at once in different rooms yeah so if it's one person how do you do that right that's what i was thinking about it's so strange that they weren't all in the same room yeah because how would you have how do you, kept them all and this, well i guess you'd probably kill the parents first because they would be the hardest ones to do unless it seems like the mom was like just sleeping well everybody was sleeping well all of them because some of them could have woken up if they heard gunshots so yeah maybe the mom was sleeping maybe the dad you know they said that the dad probably fought back because he had two bullet holes yeah so they think that maybe he tried to get up after the first one try or try to attack whoever was attacking him Yeah. yeah do something like that but maybe the kids were forced to like i could see it'd be easier with a kid to just say lay down and yeah. shoot them like on spot yeah it is true super sad but especially if it's your own fucking brother yeah and they're like terrified and their parents just yeah. died like what well they are probably they don't even do? know that because they didn't leave the room they don't know who's yeah getting... they don't they don't really even know they could have just been told to lay down don't even know so terrible just why kill the kids it's seriously such a nightmare it really is and so the defense experts actually conduct an experiment on this particular rifle that was used the marlin rifle and found that it was so loud that it could be heard almost a mile away. That's fucking loud, dude. That is. I mean, that's a pretty big caliber, or not really big, but... So then the others definitely heard it. It's a loud gun, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's surprising that the neighbors didn't even hear it, though, and stuff. Like, yeah, that is surprising. I was how did say. the neighbor? And I mean, they're not super close. It's not like, you know, our neighborhoods these days where it was yeah. on top of each other, right. but... They had like pretty big lots, I guess, maybe. And if they'd sleep deeply, then yeah, maybe they didn't hear it. But I mean, at least the kids or whoever was shot, you know, later probably Probably heard the others. Yeah. Or woke up to hearing it or something. Unless there was more than one person, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, that there's the only way that you do an execution style just like that, unless you, you did it the way that you just explained is if, you know, there's more than one person. And according to the autopsy and ballistic reports, each victim was shot as they were found face down in their beds. It seemed none of them had been awoken by the shots. Interesting. And none had put any kind of struggle or tried to hide or flee the scene. According to the autopsy. But then Ken Graguski, the former Emmonville police chief, was one of the first law enforcement professionals at the scene. And to this day, he finds it extremely hard to believe that Butch could have committed the shootings without any members of his family waking up. The own police chief thinks that's crazy. Why someone wasn't able to get out of the house is beyond belief. And then later on, Herman Race, a former New York City supervising police detective, was hired by Michael Brigante Sr. to investigate the murders. Michael Brigante had testified at trial that he did not feel that his grandson acted alone in the commission of the crime. Since Brigante did not feel that his grandson had done all this of what he was accused of and he wanted Race, a licensed investigator and friend, to either prove or disprove the case. 
So this guy, Herman Race, eventually uncovered evidence that showed that there were multiple gunmen and at least two guns used during the commission of the crime. During a private court hearing and at a trial, his findings were corroborated by the prosecutor and the medical examiner, who was astonished that one man sat accused of being the sole gunman. Because how the hell do you do it, especially if you have multiple guns? So they literally proved that there was somebody else. They just have never figured out who else it could have been. How can they know that for sure? It doesn't seem that hard to me that it could have been him. Why couldn't he have done this? There is a possibility he could have. I mean, there's a possibility, absolutely, that he may have. I, think I don't think he, it rules it out completely, even though that this that's what they're saying. It, right, I, right. Because we don't know. We, we just don't know. Yeah. For all we know, he could have used two different guns and maybe one gun was less was quieter than the other. And then they could, you know, he could boom, boom the first room and then use the other one on his parents or something, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess it would be kind of hard. But like I said, if he attacked the parents while they were not expecting it when they were sleeping, because I feel like they would be the hardest because they would try to protect the rest of the family and protect Mm -hmm. the kids and stuff. Yeah. I mean, and still the official story is that he acted alone and did this. So that's, that's what's so weird. There is some like controversy around this. I'll just put it out there. Like some that, like when you research this, you get, you get a biased view of it. Like in, you know, a lot of this research was taken from an author that wrote about this and did a ton of research has been, is very credible, has been, has probably done the most work on this, this case out of anybody that's out there. And this is the conclusion that he came to. And he actually knows that in November in 2000, uh, the author of the night that DeFeos died, Rick Osuna, actually met with Butch and Butch confessed that along with his sister, Don DeFeo, him and one of his friends actually committed the murders out of desperation. And this fact was later confirmed by a letter written by Butch DeFeo. And in his own writing, Butch wrote, quote unquote, it was cold blooded murder, period. No ghosts, no demons, just three people in which I was one in a letter that he wrote. <laughs> Well, why won't he say who else did it? What would be the point of protecting someone else? Because it would lessen your own sentence possibly or possibly help in your own case. Like, it seems very convenient to just be like, oh, someone else. But I don't know. I'm not going to tell you who it was. Well, I think we do know. I just don't know the name. They do have somebody that there's two people that it could be. There's one person I read. The same guy wrote that there's one person that may still be alive or they might both be dead. I can't remember. But there is two people that kind of been unnamed i couldn't find their names that could be so they the think third person. that two to three people could have gone into the house all stood over these people at the same time and just shot them all at right. once somehow yeah and maybe we haven't found the other guns why or, would they want to time it all out like that and stuff so they're like okay one two three and they all shot them seems kind of unbelievable i don't know that seems super but then weird. again it's weird how does one take that one rifle go from a couple different rooms all without waking anybody up and doing all that, you know, I guess, I mean, or the kids were just so scared. They didn't run or do anything. They're kids. Mm -hmm. True. They could have listened. Yeah. Could just been like, lie down on your face or something. Yep. God. I I mean, I don't think it's impossible that the, the, that butch just did all of them. That's what it kind of seems like. But I mean, I'm certainly not an expert. Sounds like the experts think there was more than one. But I definitely think there is a possibility that. But Butch has changed the story. Yeah. And he, he here's what he officially. So at this time later on, this is what he actually said happened that night of November 12th, 1974. He said, according, uh, according to Butch, you know, his father was routinely abusing the family. And after that night, there had been some sort of like blow up that happened Butch and his 18 year old sister, Don, and two of Butch's friends proceeded to get high in the basement. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and enraged that her father was preventing her from joining her boyfriend in Florida and worn out from the years of physical abuse, Don DeFeo approached her older brother about killing their parents, which Butch initially refused. So the, again, take this with a grain of salt. It's coming from Butch here. Yeah, right. right. Of course, he would love to deflect to his sister, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But he, he was goes dead on, conveniently, <laughs> right, right? Can't defend herself. That he fucking killed too. Like, anyways, <laughs> he said after a culmination of drugs, alcohol, and desperation, over the next few hours, Butch finally gave in to Don's evil request 
employing his two friends, Butch and Don left the safety of the family's basement and headed for their parents' bedroom on the second floor. So they hit that first, which at the time was around 1 a.m. on November 13, 1974. When one friend waited his lookout, the other with his Colt Python followed Butch, who had the 35 Marlin rifle. So basically, friend was with him as well. And when he walked into his father's room, there was a candle burning on his dresser and the second floor bathroom light was on. And a military style flashlight was later recovered by the police on the brown recliner in the hallway outside of the master bedroom, which was their only light source. The parents were attacked while they lay in bed. Butch said that Mr. DeVale, however, was able to struggle to his feet to attempt to counteract on his assassin, which happened to be his son. (laughs) (laughs) And then his second bullet struck him dead before he was able to reach his target. Luis DeFeo lay in bed moaning for help as she slowly bled to death and a second <sighs> bullet was uh, put into her as well. Ugh, terrible. And although the original plan, he said, was called, called for the younger children to be taken to their grandparents' house in Brooklyn, Don, according to Butch, then killed them to eliminate the children as witnesses and potential threats. I don't know about that. Why would she, if she was so angry about her parents, you'd think she would go just like kill her brother and sister, Don, the yeah, sister? Yeah, that has nothing, I feel like that makes no sense. That's, yeah, I mean, what was the deal with Don? Did she have any like Yeah, she was like history? all fucked up too. Oh, she, she was. was. Yeah, yeah, they were they're all, all fucked up. up. Yeah. Their whole family. So I mean, maybe. Pissed. Yeah, they're all pissed. Maybe. And, I mean, some families are that brutal. And theirs was really bad. Yeah. And drugs and everything else. Like it was like, mm. I'm sure it was a crazy but how did she end up dead then? Well, he, he gets to that. <laughs> yeah, he's got a, He's got an answer for everything. Yeah. So according to Butch, while his sister is literally butchering their siblings, family, yeah. Yeah. He claims he was not in the house at the time of the children's murders, but giving pursuit to one of his friends who had actually ran off away from the house. And because he was trying to get him to come back and assist with the cleanup, he said. But even at, you know, his trial, he even claimed he never admitted shooting the children. Like, he never has come clean that he shot them. He's like, I don't know. I didn't kill them. So, if you think about the, the young boys, you can only imagine, like, having your sister walking in to the room with the rifle and, like, <sighs> ordering them to put their faces down. Yeah. And then shooting them both in the back once. Just executing him if she did it if she did it right yeah i don't know man it's hard because i mean she's not here to defend herself at all and just to and you know this recollection that butch is giving is just very weird and almost seems made up in a sense because he gives immense detail about how don went into the next room which is allison's and then raised a rifle and shooting her essentially god (laughs) It's just, it's terrifying to think about waking up and having that happen to you. Yeah, that really is. I just literally had a flash in my head where I just pictured that for for one second and it. It'd be terrifying. I'd like just, yeah, stop me in my tracks. I'm like, God. Yeah. Scary to put yourself into the situation of victims. Sometimes it's like really mind blowing what people go through. Yeah. I almost feel bad like watching this on TV and stuff when this happens to fucking real people. Yeah. And like, I don't get hurt by it. Yeah, I know. It's like painless for me, but yet. I know that's that why these movies things, bother me. Like, I'm I don't having like, like a moment right now. Amityville, the, the movie, it yeah. scares me because it's like, this is a really scary, tragic event. Horrible thing that happened. So, yeah, it's, I almost feel like it's I don't so like fictionalized things fuck like to like make a movie out of it and like, yeah, sensationalize it, even yes, make it scarier. And like it. Make that's it, why I didn't want to watch it. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> Having a whole fucking like horror revolution right now. I know, it's terrible. So, yeah, I mean, Butch just basically goes on to talk about how he confronts Don in the third floor bedroom and then briefly wrestles for the gun. Butch got the upper hand and then slammed Don against the bed, knocking her out, he said. And as she lay unconscious on her bed, Butch placed the back of the rifle to her head and fired. And he ended the murder spree that was happening because of her. Uh, but then he realized, like, oh, shit, you know, we got all this shit to clean up. That's his story of events, is that essentially he blamed the entire thing on his sister. 
even though the evidence supports his direct involvement like it's pretty obvious he was involved mm -hmm. but this was like his latest version of events again like it changes all the time yeah and is, now he's blaming it completely on his sister saying it was all her so more and more of it became her fault so let me ask how does it end up that she's dead if if right you know she's the one who did everything that's like very in, very convenient to blame everything on her when she's not there to say anything yeah and either way it's still like conspiracy to commit murder like you still yeah. know what was going on you could have stopped it earlier like like it doesn't help your innocence and honestly it just shows he's fucking he's making up shit you know he's trying to justify what happened and you know i i don't know i think could she have been involved absolutely but do i think that she did the entire thing and he just you know got fed up and killed her no i don't i, I don't know it's it's so confusing like there's so many just different versions of events that that come out of this so the author of this book that we were talking about rick osuna actually contacted one of the accomplices so the people were talking about like who is the the friends you know that he talks about um and apparently um Butch actually named them at some point, but they had entered into a witness protection program for something else unrelated to the Amityville, actually. And then uh, the other accomplice named by Butch died on January 1st, 2001. And they've always refused interviews. So who knows if they're even involved or maybe they knew about it. Maybe there's like somehow a connection there to to the murders. But I don't know. The The one thing that really kind of seals, I, I don't know. Let me know if you think this really like connects her to the murder. Mm -hmm. So after, uh, upon post-mortem examination of Dawn, they discovered that she had unburned powder burns on her nightgown. Unburned powder? So like gun residue type type thing. Oh, wow. Interesting. Burn, burn. So like it had to been like really close. So she probably was holding the gun. It seems that that's what it proves. Yeah. Wow. Which would make sense how they could pull it off so quickly. Yeah. But then the but I still don't understand the reason why he would kill her or vice versa. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is like if she was involved, like why yeah. how does she end up dead? Yeah. And again, like this this could also be just natural residue or burns And she was that found happened. in her bed the same way, right? Right, exactly. Okay. So like let's go through this would she have would he have been like okay now that we've killed him or now that you have killed everyone here by laying them down now you go lay in your bed and i'm gonna kill you <laughs> yeah, it like why would she do that she had there's multiple guns in the house why wouldn't she fight back it would have been a gunfight you probably would have found her on the ground with a gun in her hand yeah or a gun near her or something yeah, the scene wouldn't have been what it was. I don't think. Yeah, if, it if that seemed, was the case. it really seems like he did it all, but I don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of different opinions about yeah, what I mean, could have happened. He's like t talked a bunch, but like, how do you verify what really happened at this right. point? Because I mean, he could come out and be like, "This is the truth," and yeah. it's version eighty-five, and we're like, "Dude, we don't believe you anymore." Like, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a mystery in a sense. Like, was it was it just him, or was there more to the? The story here but at the end of the day the official story is that he committed all six murders and yeah he's in life life in prison for it and now this is where the story <coughs> kind of turns paranormal and the haunting begins but before we do that we'll thank our last sponsors for today we'll be right back as most of us have found out the hard way including myself getting into debt is easy but getting out is hard especially if your fico score isn't great sky high interest rates can make it incredibly hard for you to break out of that revolving debt cycle thankfully now there's upstart.com the revolutionary lending platform that offers smarter interest rates to help you pay off high interest credit card debt which i know for me personally if i had known about upstart a few years ago when i was still digging myself out of credit card debt i would have most definitely went and gotten an upstart loan because of that smarter interest rate because if you don't have great credit then you get slammed with very high interest rates, which may even put you into debt more than you already are. What's great about Upstart is they go beyond your traditional FICO score or credit score when assessing your actual credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter interest rate, which is great. So they don't ding you on the credit 
part of the application. Upstart believes you're more than just a credit score. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate in just a few minutes without affecting your credit score. The best part is that once the loan is approved, most people get their funds the very next business day, the next day, which is great. Over 200,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards, student loans, fund their wedding, or to make a large purchase. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes and it won't affect your credit, which is the best part. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. So one thing that I truly love in life is subscription boxes. For some reason, it's like it feels like Christmas because you're getting this surprise gift in the mail <laughs> and it comes and sometimes you don't even remember that it's coming. So it's like a nice surprise. So one of my favorite subscription boxes is FabFitFun. This is actually a seasonal box if you've never seen it before. So it comes four times a year and it's filled with full size beauty, fitness and lifestyle products. They have a bunch of really high quality brands such as Tarte, Kate Somerville, Anthropology, Free People, Dr. Brandt, and that's just the beginning of it. So even in this box right here, we have the new Tarte skincare drink of H2O. So I'm really excited to try that. This is cruelty free, which is awesome. This box came with a lot of skincare stuff, which is great. I'm trying to redo a bunch of my skincare because I'm going completely cruelty free. Um, so these products are going to be awesome. It also has like a foot cream, everything that I would need for summer. And then it also has this really cute little dish in here and a towel, a beach towel. So you never really know what you're going to get in it. But I always love and use everything in my FabFitFun boxes. They're really fun to get. It retails for $49.99, but it is valued at over $200. So check it out at www.fabfitfun.com and use the code MILEHIGHER so you can save $10 on your first box, making it only $39.99. Again, that's fabfitfun.com and use the code MILEHIGHER because because you deserve to treat yourself. All right, so the haunting begins when the Lutz family purchases this house on December 18, 1975. And again, this the Amityville house is five bedrooms, three and a half baths, and they got it for a reduced price. But what's crazy is that they bought this house only 13 months after the murders happened in it. So like wow. a little over a year happened. So they didn't put the house on the market until probably close to December of 75? Right, right. Yeah, and I mean, it sat there and they got a discount on it. Interesting. They saved money. Yeah, and I mean, I obviously, because the word had gotten around of what had happened in there. Like, well, I mean, it's not just one that? person that died in there, it's the whole family murdered. Like, it's a pretty intense energy in that house. Exactly. Um, because, I mean, Josh and I really wanted to do a paranormal episode and we really want to talk more about the paranormal and ghosts. But we also, neither of us have had a really like intense paranormal experience i've had one but ish nothing more that i could talk about and I, we really want to get like some experts on to talk about this kind of thing but we have been researching a ton about the paranormal um and ghosts yeah. and how they if you know if someone dies especially if they're murdered in a place they can hang on their energy can like hang on to that space and kind of rule it yeah. and haunt it. Haunt it, right, um, exactly. Which I think is very real and very Absolutely. scary. We really want to get some experts on to help explain this kind of stuff because we really don't know how to, but. <laughs> no, I mean, but does anybody know how to explain paranormal right, shit? Right, but like, there's people that, yeah, you know, have dedicated their lives had experiences to it. and can yeah. really like explain it, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to give misinformation. No, totally. Um, I mean, this is something I'm glad you're at least interested in, like the spiritual aspect to it, the spiritual. Realm. Oh, I, I know you're not a fan am. of like brutal murder and stuff like that. And I totally I was a understand fan of brutal murder. I'm a big fan of brutal murders, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sorry, I said that just... really wrong. It came out just way wrong. man. I'm not afraid of I'm not a fan of horror you know movies I mean. and, and horror and scary things like that. But I do believe in ghosts, although I don't like to fuck with them. Like I would never go right. explore a haunted house. I would never go into this. You fucking don't want to go try and communicate with it. No. no, I get like sick. Like if I even feel like anything in a space, I feel like I can feel that type of stuff. It makes me sick. I don't even like, I really don't even like going around graveyards and cemeteries. Cause I feel like really? uncomfortable. Interesting. I really feel like you should, respect the dead i don't want them to be mad at me i don't want them to hang on to me in any way like this kind of stuff really freaks me out but i do believe in it yeah so you think that in this amityville house after the six of them you know were murdered in it like imagine 
like you it said, it could this. be haunted, but that's could. Could. How do we not know? Not in all cases. It seems like not in all cases people who are murdered hang around, but in a lot of cases, especially a brutal, angry murder like that, that maybe they could, especially in a family, a home right, where there was right. so much anger and so oh, much I'm animosity sure between them. There. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely could be haunted. Like, I think so. But the thing is, is that this Lutz family that bought this, we're not sure if they what their intentions. Saw, yes. Were. What are their intentions here? Because they could have seen this as an opportunity. No one wants this house. Would. We can probably get a sick deal on this house because no one fucking wants it. And, you know, we could have it for a temporary amount of time and like cash in on this paranormal thing because of what has happened here. Right. And I'm sure the rumors around the town we're really getting going, you know, I'm sure a lot of people were kind of interested in that. Well, it seems so. like other than maybe cleaning up the house, they left everything the same. Yes, they the they spent 400 bucks. That's it to buy all the furniture that the DeFeo family had in their house, which is so weird. Like who would go into someone's house and be like, yo, I want all this furniture. Well, I guess it does happen like in really yeah, rich places yeah. and stuff, but 400 bucks. For, for everything nice ass shit like we were talking kept about their like giant ass portraits <laughs> i don't know man i would just All kidding right. i would sell that shit Bit straight of off the bat yeah so like they buy the they and the furniture is fucking in the same place it was the night of the murders as far as we know you know but so still weird. just thinking about how creepy and weird that is why would you buy a house yeah. And move into it with all the same furniture from a family that yeah. was just killed in the house. Mm. Seems like maybe Unless, they wanted to keep the creepiness going. Right. I mean, and that's where that's really like first sign of, hmm, are they up to something more here than just, right. you know, innocent family moving into this house? Because, yeah, like literally not even a few years after this author who became famous, Jay Anson, wrote the bestseller titled the Amityville horror, which is where the whole fucking like led this story gets propelled from just a local case right. to a horror, literally like icon, like it's icon status. Now it's literally everybody knows it. You know, everybody yep. knows the Amityville horror, the Amityville yep. murders, things like that, because literally where this book started and there's been over 20 movies made on this story in some fashion. Obviously they change and add things to to it but they've really capitalized the amount of money that's been made off of this fucking poor family yeah is absurd and they haven't gotten any of it like definitely not and that's what's just so suspicious is like the Lutz family was like oh yeah they cashed in big let's, time uh, yeah let's fucking team up here and uh, make hella money off this so according to them and according to this book they give a recollection of, of the paranormal events that occurred in the house when the Lutz family moved in because they actually only lived in the house for 28 days mm. and then they fled. They fled. They're like, we're out. We're out. It's fucking crazy. So listen to what happened here. It's very short. So according to the book, a priest actually was there when the family moved in to bless it. Okay, so the Con fact that they showed boom. up day yeah. one with the with priest, the they on. knew it was haunted. Yeah. Like, they knew what they were getting into, and they'd be like, oh, it'd be really great for the story if we started it out with a nice priest yeah. blessing. Well, it shows they know about paranormal right oh, there. It yes, gives away the paranormal. Because yes. unless, you, unless you were, like, really religious, maybe, but even then, I'm like, I don't know any really religious people, maybe back then, who would, like, get a priest to, like, bless... I guess maybe or, to bless, I guess pray they could have it. heard, though. They right. could have heard what had happened there. They probably did. That's I mean, what, chances are they know what had happened there either way. Yeah, that's um, what happened. Even if they weren't trying to make money off of it. But they could have been, like, to their credit, like, yeah, let's just, you know, some crazy shit happened here. Let's get the priest to come in. But yeah. I don't know. It does seem very... It smells of scam and... I don't know, though. And, like, at the same time, I'm like... Well, if I was moving into that house, I'd probably do the same thing. I'd want every. I would never move I'd into want that shaman, house. I'd want a shaman. I'd want a fucking like. Yeah, I mean, I would stage that bitch. That's for sure. But everybody coming through there to yeah rid that house of because you know there's some fucking bad energy there. Yep. But then again, it does it does look suspicious, right? So there, the Lutz family is unloading their moving van, and the priest goes into the house and starts doing his thing, and he goes upstairs to the second floor and enters the northeast bedroom, which is where Mark. And John uh, were where they stayed. And as he sprinkled holy water around the room and recited a prayer, he heard a loud male voice allegedly say, get out. 
Oh. Although the priest did not tell the family about the voice, which what? Why wouldn't you tell the family about the yeah, voice? Yeah, what? What? Yes, yeah, according to the story. Yeah, <laughs> I better not tell them about that guy. Oh my god! <laughs> the priest did warn them, however, to not use it as a bedroom. Don't let anybody sleep in there. Supposedly. Oh. Yeah. And according to an article, actually, from that time, the Lutz has actually followed the priest's advice and turned the room into a sewing room. And from the very first night they moved in, the family claimed they felt strange sensations. In the book, he wrote that the family's personality drastically changed. That's like classic for any like horror story, yeah. you know, like an yeah. innocent family moves in and there's they all slowly get angrier and, you know, more violent. But then again, maybe they are. On one occasion in the book, the young couple beat their children with a strap and large wooden spoon. After moving to the house, the children apparently had become brats. Ooh. And then over the next few weeks, things got even worse. There was a stench of bile to the smell of cheap perfume. The fam be the fam. There we go. The fam became increasingly perplexed by the mysterious odors that would emanate from different locations of the house. Black stains appeared on the toilets and could not be lifted even with Ew. Clorox. Oh, the Ew, fuck? that's some nasty shit. I would be like, what the fuck is yeah, this? Seriously, I'd move out because of that. Like, Get me out of here. Then it gets better. Green slime <laughs> ran down the walls. Green slime. That's some extremely paranormal that shit. Like, that sounds fake, honestly. Yeah, I haven't I'm heard like, of that in any other cases. Well, like, I'm like, why would a cases? fucking ghost like want to slime us like yeah or, how do you be, or you know like why would a spirit or entity or demon whatever the fuck do you want to call like it like nickelodeon yeah slime like, shit let's slime these guys <laughs> i'll scare them <laughs> slime their asses or put some black stains on there see how they like that like it, it, it does make you wonder like that all yeah. sounds very like made up right mm-hmm, like it does. as crazy and scary as that is like i'm just like did they really do that shit? Like, yeah. why would they do that shit? Why would they fuck with my toilet and fuck with my wall? And why would they do that? You know? Yeah. That to me, just like, I don't know. I'm pretty skeptical about that. And apparently hundreds of flies appeared in the sewing room one Ew. day, even though it was the middle of Ew, the winter. That's so gross. That's always like in any horror movie where there's tons of flies. I'm like, Oh, that'd be awful. You know, walking into a room with like hundreds and billions of flies flying yeah. around you, all disease looking. And then, of course, in the book and in the movies and everywhere else, pretty much there's always the, you know, the crucifix that's on the wall that gets flipped down, you know, like the whatever evil spirit is in the house is like flipping all the crosses upside down, which, you know, they always like try to tie it to to like a demonic type possession, right. like a sat- satanic thing. You know, it mm-hmm. always goes back to like this. Why do evil spirits automatically get associated with satan and lucifer and hell yeah why does it always go there first like what if these spirits are just like maybe they're angry or they're a negative energy but maybe it's not like like they're not doing it in direct response to it being like a religious thing you know yeah yeah totally they're just doing it because it's a natural on the wall negative with positive it. of the the world but right. i think that religious people believe that anything negative stems back to the devil right yeah well, so. yeah. I mean, anybody that believes any sort of Judaic, uh, Christian, Catholic, any of those religions. Yeah, so there you go. Believe in a hell. And, it's, you know, if you see it, that's why they don't like seeing crosses flipped upside down. You flip up, you flip a cross upside down in any Christian house, you're going to have a problem. Like, yeah, if I did that in front of my mom, my mom would be like, Josh, are you OK? What is wrong? We need to go to church right now. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, instantly that's just like known. You don't do that. Yeah. You don't flip the cross upside down or the crucifix. And then the phenomena turned physical. Kathy Lutz was victimized by unseen touches. Ooh, mm. Whatever that means. Yeah. Like credit carded. <laughs> 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 Just cre- credit carded by a fucking ghost or a spirit or a oh demon my or gosh. something. You know, people say you can have sex with ghosts. That's a whole nother fucking thing. Oh my god! No, whole nother. Yeah. Podcast. Oh, I've I've heard a couple people that are like, yeah, I have intimate relations Again, with a spirit. That's something else I heard Trisha Paytas say in that Chris <laughs> Clemens video. She oh, says yeah. she has sex with ghosts. I'm All very right. curious yeah, about I'm it. Sure, that's yeah. I'm curious. I've heard a lot of people say they have sex with ghosts. I'd love I've to heard hear Whoopi more about Goldberg it. Goldberg talk about it. I don't know if she's like done it, but she's talked about it. I just don't understand how that makes sense, but. 
I don't think there's like actual Anything's penetration possible. involved. I think it's just like anything's possible. Spiritual <laughs> loving. I don't know. Ah, I feel it radiates. <laughs> I don't know. It's strange, but I, know, I would be super interested to talk to someone who's had ghost sex. That's a whole nother topic. Ooh. But yeah, that'd be creepy to be touched. By be ghost. touched and then like sometimes forced to pass out. Ooh. Just get like knocked out. And then on the other hand, George Letts would sit by the fire for hours because he suffered from constant chills. Because, like, that's one thing in a lot of paranormal cases that is a similarity is, like, cold spots, cold areas are really hot. Like, temperature changes yeah, is really interesting to me. Like, there's a lot of, and that's the thing with this whole story and just horror in general is it takes unexplained phenomena and just dramatis- or dramatizes, dramatizes it, it yeah, and makes it way crazier than it actually needs to top. be, even though it's already fucking crazy. If right. you think about it, like... Right. Something is clearly happening, but we're not focusing on that word, you know, taking it up up a couple levels. So he had constant chills in the house and he would wake up nightly at 3.15 a.m. Randomly. And he believed that there was a connection between that was the time that supposedly the family had died and he's now waking up at that time. And as the months progressed, apparently the situation worsened for the family. The author reported that George woke one night to witness his wife transform into a 90-year-old hag. (laughs) Oh my god, what the fuck? That seems so hard to believe. I just feel like this is so fucking over the top. Like, I've heard paranormal stories and they're just not, like, this theatrical, like... Nobody's getting transmorphed into a fucking hag. Yeah. <laughs> and I really do believe in hauntings. Like, yeah, I believe yeah, yeah, in a lot of yeah. haunted houses. But I give it more just, dignity and respect than that. It seems like this family just totally cashed in on this whole haunted it, idea. And I mean, at the time, really sad. it was perfect timing because, like, this yeah. was like when horror was really just starting Booming. to get going and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and people ate that up. They're like, Yum, 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 yum. Give me that <laughs> fucking horror tea, yeah. man. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, they gave a really dramatic story about what happened. And apparently after she transformed into the hag, the next night she began levitating off the bed. Her husband had to grab her before she floated away. Floaty, floaty. <laughs> That's just like, <laughs> like such a uh, sh- load of shit. So now How she's come they getting... didn't get a documentary then, like a good documentary? It was in the 1970s, bruh. Still, like, now? Yeah, Why would no. they come to them now? Because a book is way easier to sell at the time. Yeah, man. that's true. You don't have to answer questions on People camera. People had fucking, like, shitty-ass TVs, man. They didn't mm. even have, like, color mm. stuff, really. You know? They did? The 70s? Yeah, but, I mean, it was shit. Yeah, but by the 80s, I feel like they could have done something, or, like, the 90s, or... Why don't they even go back to these people yeah. now? Are they yeah. still alive? I wonder if they're alive. Maybe not. <laughs> the Lutzes? I don't know could be probably honestly yeah i'm surprised they haven't done but no anything. the book sold like fucking hotcakes man yeah the book would be easier easy easy yep and people really like it was a story yeah the whole story because i mean yeah it's not like everybody reading it was like oh, so they this made is mad fat. money off this. oh millions and millions of dollars yep it seems like they they had it all planned before they even moved into the house. Yeah, and and here's where the story really just gets broken wide open because according to the story, the family got so scared, realized they needed help, contacted the same priest that had originally come to the house to perform another blessing. And according to this book, the priest had been feeling after effects from the first blessing, of course. And basically whatever was haunting their house was also haunting the priest. Yeah. Now this was literally just completely false because the actual priest was contacted and the guy said that he never even set foot in the house. They had a phone call. (laughs) What? Okay. So this, this is definitely bullshit. So Butch's lawyer named William Weber did a radio interview with the priest Mm -hmm. and he said that. Wow. So that right there just basically like, I mean, (laughs) yeah, the very beginning is a lie. Like, so can you even trust this at all? Mm -mm, mm -mm. I don't think you can. I mean, it's, uh, and it's so like out there. It's like, come on, like really really levitating out the bed. Like that's scary and all I get it. 
it makes for a good fucking horror movie. I'll give you that. Whenever yeah. they do that shit, mm -hmm. like when they start flying off or covers get ripped, you know, ripped off. And I mean, whatever that might happen, but like levitating bodies, like that's crazy. Yeah, that really is. Could it really happen? It could. Fuck, man. Happened I mean, it could me. happen. Something happened to me. No, man. dude, you don't want that. Trust me. <laughs> I listened to like YouTube videos of people who have been, who've gone through like hauntings or have been haunted by something or have felt like a something's attached yeah, to them. Yeah. And it's fucking terrifying. Like none, you do not want to have an experience like this. Trust me. Well, I it's need to talk scary. to some people because I want to have this experience because I want to confirm you want to My. get thrown around in your bed by a demon? <laughs> <laughs> I want to fucking go toe to toe with one, man. No way, man. I don't know. I want to have a fucking like. Josh little... really wants to stay overnight at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado in, in Estes Park, which is where The Shining was filmed. And it's supposed to be really haunted. I have a whole video on it on my channel. I believe it's 100% haunted. Oh, it is. I mean, we, we went saw on the ghost tour. Yeah, we we saw literally it. saw some shit. Right yeah. in front of our eyes. Doors open in. We saw shit. It felt so haunted in oh, there. Like, yeah. Yeah. And people, it is like people stay there every night and things happen every fucking night to people in there. So that On hotel is tour. haunted. Shane stayed there. Shane Dawson and Ryland. And them. Fuck yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah, he did. So we want to do that Wonder eventually, but I, I don't know. I'm kind of terrified. Like I know that there will be no sleeping for me if we do that. Like it'll be an oh, all no. night. I wouldn't want to sleep. No, but Why like, that's when they say that the ghost comes out. Like when you're sleeping, I need to like, I need that experience. I need to feel that. I don't know. I feel like I'm stuck behind a wall and of like, like wanting to believe. And yeah, not I think that like to. because of my upbringing and because I was so programmed that I'm still deprogramming myself yeah. and therefore like you don't have any walls up for your connection to the spiritual realm. But mm -hmm. I feel like I still have all these walls put up and like mm -hmm. filters and area. I'm not truly connecting with it. So like I'm Makes seeing sense. stuff, but I'm not feeling like what you're feeling. Like I don't walk into right. a space and feel energies. I really don't. As much I as I try I to, I can't like, I can feel my own energy, but I can't feel anything else. I had even, okay. So tonight Josh and I were even, um, we were looking at like, we were at this house. We were just looking just at a this random area. house for sale. And we were like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, I just was standing on the property and I started feeling like super sick and weird. I want to go into that house because yeah. it is for sale. I want to like yeah, fuck a what, what, thing and go. Yeah, we were just like checking out this person's house because it happened to be for sale. But yeah, I don't know. I like started See, feeling I don't get sick. That I was on their property. I started feeling sick and I wasn't even in the house. And it's an older house. Um, so I've never it'll be walked, interesting. Yeah, I've never walked in anywhere. Even at the Stanley, I did. Like you can definitely feel like, you know how people say you can feel the air is heavy or you feel like cold cold. And yeah, I did feel that in like the most haunted area. Yeah. I definitely felt a little bit of that. I for felt sure. off too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as for like just anywhere else, like I don't usually yeah. feel that too much. Like, and I mean, I have no idea the, the house we were at tonight. I could have just been having like a anxiety. I don't know. It felt like I was about to have an anxiety attack. My heart was like racing. I was having heart palpitations. I felt sick I like, and uh -oh. nauseous and dizzy. Like. I felt like I was going to throw up. It was so weird. I just wanted to get out of there. And we were just standing in like a backyard. Um, so I don't know. I need to go in the actual house and see if it was just like <laughs> part of my health issues or if it was actually yeah, something. I'm curious now to I see. felt really weird. I can't even explain it. I wanted to like rip my hair out standing there. <laughs> it was bizarre. See, that's weird. And because I was not, I had the opposite experience. I was like, yeah, I could have just amazing. been feeling sick or I don't, I don't so really good. know. Yeah. I felt weird, but. I don't know. I just, I think that's interesting. And, and I definitely want to experience the paranormal. I want one of my paranormal. parents to come on and talk about their experience staying in. I wish they would come together for it. Even though they're divorced, maybe they'll come together for a podcast on <laughs> Mrs. Boggs house that they used to stay in the haunted house. Yeah. I've talked about it on this before, but really they have some pretty crazy stories of like, my mom was like locked in a room by a ghost. She thought my dad locked her up in this attic room. And it turned out that there was act, like somehow a chair got put up underneath the doorknob and she couldn't get out. She was locked in wow. there and she thought my dad was wow, fucking with her, but he was actually setting up a fireplace on a whole different area of the house. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. And they, my mom said she would see towels move and stuff. And yeah, my dad, see, is, stuff and my is, dad believes it. Yeah. And my dad's yeah. like really, really cynical about that kind of stuff. Not oh, cynical, yeah. skeptical. skeptical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. See, and that stuff is the most believable to me when I see evidence of things opening and closing mm -hmm. and like, 
it's little things that you may not catch in the moment yep. too that that happen that you just aren't aware of. And I think that's what a lot of parent or a paranormal and, and just phenomena in general is. Yes. It's things that happen all around us all the time that are unexplained, yet we just don't notice them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you like did a replay on life, there's probably so many moments where we're yeah. experiencing paranormal shit. No, we definitely are, I think. And we just don't know it. Have you ever had a feeling that like something is with you or you're not alone and when you actually are alone? I've had times where I'm like, I'm not alone right now or I don't feel like I just feel like something else is there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Or I would like to experience you. more. But like I said, I like there's a fine line for me. You don't have a desire to like immerse yourself in. No, because I really feel like it's disrespectful to fuck with the ghost too much. I, I don't know. That's my opinion on it. I just but what feel about like, like, obviously there's spirits that want to communicate with you like mediums and stuff. They're communicating. No, I love that. If they come to the medium, that means they want to communicate. But if you're sitting in a haunted house, like provoking a spirit, trying to catch it on camera and yelling at it and trying to record it and saying, are you mad? And they're literally like, get out. And you just stay. That's where I'm like, I would never do that shit. Yeah, but they're trying to get the evil spirits out. You don't want it, that to happen. <laughs> okay, I mean, or they could just stay there. Oh, that's what but I'd say. Can't. Let them stay and move, bitch. So if the Amityville house was haunted and it had evil spirits in it, you don't think they should go and get those out? No, so I think they more should people can just move be in. able to live there on their own. They, should they don't pay rent. The they don't alone. fucking do shit, man. Dude, there was five of them murdered in there. If there's actually ghosts in there, they should be able to stay. That's all I'm saying. Okay, but how... <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about ghost rights ghost here, rights people. <laughs> You're a ghost activist. I like it. I am. Yeah, I have this. Because I mean, for I me, bad. I'm like, if there is evil spirits or demons are are actually a real thing, then I think absolutely we need people fucking get. If there's a way to get them out of here or return them, what about like? Do you think that people can take these spirits or ghosts and kind of force them? Where either where they came from or into whatever's next or do you think there's an ability to like kind of push them forward like maybe they're kind of stuck like jammed in a like fucking drain you gotta unclog the drain and let them like get through and they need your help sometimes they need you to like communicate well, i guess in that sense see this is through. why i need someone like i need a paranormal person to come talk to me and explain well, this good stuff thing to we me got one. i just don't understand the world enough to like want to fuck with it i'm scared of it a little bit i believe in it so much that it scares me you know i understand i understand and i think again i think an expert will be able to provide some more insight than yeah. what than what we can yeah definitely which by the way i think we got at least two potential guests paranormal experts so get we got some good I'm guests excited. lining Ooh, up you yes. guys Ooh. we're getting excited we're Ooh. having some experts and people who can like lay the knowledge down on you guys yeah, because you know. I mean, fuck, we're not experts, guys. We're not. <laughs> well, clearly. We use Google. <laughs> well, I kind of am a little bit, but. Oh, sure. <laughs> JK, JK. <laughs> so, yeah, the rest of the Amityville story, as far as the book goes, they claim that their their daughter had befriended an invisible red-eyed pig named Jody. Ew. And Jody could not be. Yeah. Ew, what the what? fuck, man? Why a red-eyed pig? Who the fuck would be like, yo, this is my friend, my red-eyed pig friend named Jody. <laughs> Just reminds Jody? me. Jody. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jody. Oh my god. I'm a red eyed pig. I'm invisible. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Scary? Hell yeah. But real? I don't know. Apparently at times it was a little bit bigger than a teddy bear and other times bigger than the house. Ooh. Ooh. Fuck. Damn. Oh man. So they go on and they have so many other stories where Jody's standing behind his stepdaughter in her bedroom and then Separate evening, she started to see two red eyes peering through the darkness from the window. Like Jody's now looking in through the window. So basically, just a bunch of creepy faces looking through the windows and stuff. It also talked about how, like, and this is kind of more believable. There is, you know, forces, unexplained forces, which cause significant property damage to the house, such as the front door being ripped off its hinges, windows being smashed, banisters being torn. I mean, again, paranormal or just normal weather could be either. I think. Yeah. But of course, the meteorological stations are like, oh, there's no no weather. It could have been that. So it's obviously some paranormal forces that were ripping the house to shreds. Jeez. But I mean, it's like 
this if the, all the shit is happening this is the most fucking crazy paranormal <laughs> this is like hell this is like the hell the real hell house right yeah seriously if all this is happening there's a red-eyed pig running around like oh, scaring so you scary They're, your house is getting ripped apart your mom's levitating off the bed like <laughs> jesus God. christ man even the dog's getting choked it's just like it's brutal yeah i mean all these events are are crazy and I don't know. Uh, here's one more. The wild one of the wilder claims is that George woke up one night to the sound of a marching band in his living room. <laughs> what? There's a haunted. There's a ghost pretending to be a marching band. But I don't understand. Like if it was the ghosts from the house, like it should be the family that's haunting them. Like why would all these random ghosts be in this, the house? Great fucking point. You know, like because why? we've talked about, we have looked into hauntings yes. where there are creepy other things that aren't people who have died there but they were brought in summoned by people in the past mm -hmm. according to people in history so yeah what the hell so the explanation is for in this case could be complete bullshit <laughs> but but i'll give it to you apparently george lutz dabbled in like black magic like occult Oh. And I hate saying occult because like I'm learning more about the occult, which is re really fascinating to me. It's it can be kind of dark, but it yeah. is very interesting because a lot of people are confused. The occult is like any is really, you know, like witchcraft, black magic, mm -hmm. ritualistic stuff doesn't necessarily mean like Satan or Lucifer yeah. or anything or anything that have to do with hell or demons. But it could be like some type of evil entities being summoned via black magic and things like that. Yes. Um. So George was known to dabble in that. Is there any evidence of him doing any sort of ritualistic practices or anything like that in the house? Mm. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so, but that's people's reason for why this could have happened and why, you know, maybe he summoned something and then maybe it attached itself to them. And when they left the house, it went with them. <laughs> and yeah, cause they, I think they did say shit started happening after they left too. So it, maybe they did have some crazy shit happening in there because he summoned something well like what the fuck are you doing dude you move into this like it's so clear especially when you hear he ba he dabbled in the occult then he definitely moved in this house because he thought it was haunted and he could like stir some shit up i don't know it's like it's something another. like that i am just less likely to believe their story and the fact that they were literally only in it for 28 days yeah is kind of yes like, really guys you just bought it and then you're out in 28 days yeah, it's really they weird. They apparently moved to their mother's home, Kathy's mother's home in Babylon, mm. Long Island. So that was their claims. That was the book. Again, we don't know about whether that story is true or not. But what we do know is that famous, well, world-renowned paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren, which Lorraine actually just recently died this year. Oh, um, These guys are legends yeah, in the paranormal, the paranormal world. I mean, they're really the four, you know, we're at the forefront of this field and they actually went to this house. They went to the Amityville house in 1976 to, con to conduct a seance in the house. And when they were doing this, they also, or actually they also brought along uh, a do two doctors from the American Society for uh, Psychical Research, as well as the Senior Research Associate from the Psychical Research Foundation. So not only do you bring doctors, but they, they brought everybody to the seance, mm -hmm. which Lorraine Warren was a clairvoyant. So she interesting. Yeah. So she goes into these places and is able to conduct a seance or, you know, commune with the dead, I believe is the, what's happening there. And this is interesting. So the encounter was so awful and was so sinister that she felt that there was absolutely nothing she could do to help or eject uh, the spirit from the house. Apparently they encountered Butch's spirit during the seance. Mm. So I don't know. I, again, I don't, I'm not an expert on seances. I don't know exactly how that would work, but according to this article, essentially they said that when she was doing the seance, she encountered Butch's spirit during it and that his spirit was so awful and so sinister. Like his spirit was somehow part of the house. How is he in jail? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, I don't know. He's I, not I don't know. Dead. That could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. Don't take my word on that. I don't. I don't know for sure. That's really strange. Because I couldn't. I couldn't like 
cross reference this. So yeah, there's I'm so wrong much that, BS I don't know. when it comes to this case. It seems like there's just so much random stuff out there. But other than, and again, this is clairvoyance connecting with the spirit too. But as far as supernatural events that happened during these seances that were held that night, um, basically there wasn't that much that happened. I mean, there was a few, what they say, there was moans and groans, black shadow. And then there's this picture that they took that supposedly maybe shows a demonic boy photograph is what it's called. Hmm. But then again, I mean, I don't know for sure if that was taken on that night. That's what they said. But I mean, that could be a, you know, double exposed photo or something that has some weird stuff in it. Yeah. I mean, it does kind of look like a head. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it is like glowing creepy eyes looking. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fake, fake pictures out there. It's not that hard to fake shit. No, ghost photos are super, are easy actually pretty easy to fake. Yeah. Spirit photography actually began in the early 1860s. <sighs> so they've been able to do that kind of stuff for a long time. But both the American Psychical Foundation and the Research Foundation said that there was nothing paranormal in the house. They further added that they would have used scientific methods to measure any phenomena had any been present and not the psychic method, methods of the Warrens. So the Warrens were having these psychic experiences in the house, but these other doctors that were there did not report any sort of paranormal events while they were in there and the seances were occurring. So like Lorraine was having experiences, but they weren't psychic experience because she's psychic clairvoyant, but they weren't like a lot of the best people in the ghost hunting are clairvoyant, but it makes sense. If you think about it, like I think the people that are going to have the most intense experience are the ones that are able to connect to that. Right. Right. Cause like, I feel like if you and I, yeah, if you and I went into a, a actually haunted place, which one of us would start having paranormal phenomena happening to us first? Maybe you because because you just already have that happen and just fucking go into some random house, you know, Yeah. and I don't I don't feel that unless I'm in a really intense environment. <laughs> but I have no idea. I could have just literally felt sick or had a random anxiety true. attack. That, and that's true with all this stuff is mm-hmm. right. It yeah. could all just be fucking made up in the brain. Could be us mistaking shit for other things or brain playing. Well, I think a us. lot of this paranormal stuff, like there's a lot of truth in it, but there's also a lot of mis mm-hmm. uh, or people that are confused or think they've experienced things that they haven't. Yeah, no. I think <sighs> it is tough, though. It really is tough because mm-hmm. a lot of it is bullshit, unfortunately. Like, yeah. I see a lot of, you know, the more I've dug into this field, the more I've realized there's a lot of people just faking shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all day, every day. Yeah. And because people will fall for it, unfortunately. Like, some people just believe everything that, you know, is crazy and mm-hmm. outrageous. Like, the fucking article on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> like, Jesus. Yeah. Oh my God. People had been sending me this article. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this, but it was like this guy named Jerry Richards who had apparently killed 700 people, had 700 bodies on his property in Naples, Florida. And I was like, and people are sending it to me like, do a podcast on this. I was like, yo, so all you got to do is Google Gary Richardson or whatever the fuck his name was. And it came up like two s- seconds and said, scroll hoax. down on the tweet. Like, <laughs> Well, and just think like if seven, if someone had 700 bodies on their yard, you'd hear about it. It'd be on yeah. like CNN. <laughs> it'd be everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't just like fly under the radar. Oh my God. That'd be, ins- <laughs> that'd be like insanity. Yeah. dude. Yeah. It really would. <laughs> That's like, that'd be worse than like digging up H.H. H. Holmes old spot. Like, oh yeah. Ooh. Yeah, no, that'd be insane. So again, like people will believe the most ridiculous things, unfortunately. And yeah. for me, I always look at this unexplained phenomena stuff. Like I believe, I believe a lot of it is real, even though I have never experienced it or seen it firsthand mm-hmm. based upon other people's experiences. Right. Cause yeah. do I know for sure if I think it's hundred percent real? No, I don't know. Cause I've never experienced it myself. Yeah, how are you supposed to know? Yeah. And like, if there's a way to experience the paranormal, to see if it's really real for you or not, then like, why not do that? Just yeah. so that you can see. Yeah. Cause I feel like after you have a real paranormal experience, you're going to figure out like, do I want to have anything to do with this or not? Like, yeah, you, yeah. You'll either be intrigued or you want to stay the fuck like, away. Yeah. yeah. Like, like get me away from this. Yep. So, so yeah, it really seems pretty obvious that the, the let's is most likely fabricate fab, fabricated these stories. Yeah. In order Just from to the sell, kind of people they were. Yeah, in order to sell the book, The Amityville Horror, which sold more than 3 million copies, 
And then it was turned into a major motion picture, which grossed more than $80 million. Wow. So much, man. 80 million. Did they get a piece of that too? Oh, yeah. And then they went on tour, promoted the book as a true story too. Wow. And that's another thing that I've learned kind of from researching this too, is like a lot of these movies that are like based on a true story or based on true events, you got to really look at it deep because how much of it was really based on true events. Like they might take like just a general premise and then run with it and blow it up and make it crazier. Mm -hmm. Like some of the scariest movies I've ever seen, like The Conjuring or sinister like i'm like hmm yeah or the strangers like that's yeah. one that creeped me out a lot dude i don't know how you watch that kind of stuff that just the commercials scare me i know exactly what you're talking about i've <laughs> even seen it yeah i don't know and see that's the thing is i i get i do get scared i'm not gonna lie i get scared when i watch that stuff and like it freaks me out Sometimes afterwards, I'll be like, don't want to be alone. I, I'm paranoid that somebody, See, I yeah, hear just noises like, why do that and stuff. To yourself? I don't get it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'd I think rather it's... learn about some real shit that could actually happen to me. I don't know. Honestly, you'd think the real stuff would scare me more because that's obviously more yeah. likely to have to happen. Right. Like a, I don't know why. I seriously don't know why. I'm so weird. I hate scary movies, but I love true crime. I love all this stuff. I just don't like to watch it acted out. I get that. And... I think you're a lot of people are in the same boat as you. Like, yeah, some people just don't want to put that negativity in their head. And I get that. Yeah, like, exactly. If you have anxiety, it's like, why make, why give myself anxiety yeah. for two hours? Like, I just, which I mean, I wouldn't be like watching that kind of shit every day. Like, yeah, I couldn't do that every day. Yeah. Like, I don't watch that often, like mm-hmm. well, here and there. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, the one, the last interesting thing I'll mention about the Lutzes is that they did take a lie detector test about their story and they did pass that. Interesting. Which, again, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Like people can f- fake you know, lie detectors, fake easily. lie detectors, or but I don't know. I mean, they could be telling the truth. I don't have the it's lie detector say. test in front of me, it's so I don't fucking say. know. Interesting story, though. It really is. It's extremely interesting. So, where's that house now? You want to go see it? <laughs> no. And they tell like they've interviewed people in the town. They're like, please don't come see it. Yeah, they're so sick of it because people yeah. flock there every year yeah. to fucking see take pictures of it and yeah. play. Because it's privately owned now. It was actually last sold in the summer of 2016. And they actually changed the address from 112 to now 108 Ocean Avenue, which that did nothing if they're yeah, trying to yeah, like people still keep know. people away yeah. from it. But well, yeah. it'd be interesting to talk to the current owners and see if they're having any issues or if they've noticed anything. Yeah. Imagine living in that house, man. But still, like even just the fact, would you ever want to live in a house that had no. something as Dude, I'd tear tragic, that down and build a new. Brutal, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I feel like, fuck. Yeah. And you see that in so many hauntings where people, that's the reason why their shit's haunted is because literally, you know, people died in their house and uh, people that have died in, you know, a negative way. Yeah. Oftentimes linger behind and can imprint or whatever and start haunting the place or the space or whatever. And yeah, I think that's very possible. So yeah, I would just tear the shit down. But I mean, apparently people are living in it and they haven't torn it down yet. And in according to Zillow, it sold for 605,000 in February of 2017. And none of the other owners have reported experiencing anything paranormal while in the residence. Yeah. So there you go. So right there. Everybody except for the Lutzes have yeah. not experienced. Paranormal. <laughs> Interesting. So it's like either what happened was George was some type of black mage summoner that summoned a demon from the depths of, or he just was interested in this whole world. He saw an opportunity. Yeah. And he jumped. Maybe and they're like, and we get this house wicked cheap and look what we could do, babe. Flip it. And make this whole thing. Flip get it. Rich. <laughs> yeah. Flip it into a whole story. Flip yeah. it into a flip lot of fucking a, money. Flip it into millions. Interesting. Crazy. So like there's some, People have, oh, you know, over time been like, oh, there's this reason why it could be haunted. This reason that could be haunted. Like some people have said that there was old Indian burial, burial grounds underneath yeah. it, things like that. Or Which I'm pretty sure debunked. our house is too, though. Like this whole area I mean, in Colorado knows, everywhere is Native American. For all we know, yeah. Yeah. But like they thought it was like a really like a planned burial ground. And it's not like they've debunked pretty much all the claims as far as to why it could be haunted or they did say like someone from Salem came down and was like a witch or something and, and lived in it. I mean, you know how yeah. people Rumors. find every reason to yeah. 
try well, to like make a what place do you haunted. guys think let us know do you think that the house is actually haunted and who do you think carried out the murders was it just butch or yeah. was it butch and don or butch don and someone else we don't know about or was it just like one of them got possessed and could then, there be have been a possession yeah, yeah was one possessed even though there's no evidence that he was possessed because he did like get rid of everything very methodically but yeah i mean who knows i mean yeah let us know what you guys think about this or yes, please your opinions on this interesting case but yeah i like talking about the paranormal so it's yeah, kind of fun it we is. should do a more like haunted ghost yes, type thing one yeah. that's not bullshit <laughs> <laughs> not bullshit haunting yes i and like i said we want to get some paranormal yeah we will we will we have we will one be getting we have one which in the works yes yeah. it's a pretty well, big maybe deal. the next like week or two even what yeah really yeah like asap oh, asap. asap rocky okay <laughs> <laughs> we just like beam that back to each other. That's so Stop. funny. My dog's attacking my leg. She's done. She's she like, just wants we're to go upstairs. But it is like almost midnight. We're <laughs> podcasting. Sorry, puppy. Sorry. But we will go ahead and wrap it up there, guys. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed this episode of the Mile Higher Podcast. If you did, leave us a like, subscribe, follow us on Spotify, iTunes, Instagram, Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> Check us out. Follow us so you never miss an episode or some juicy news. But yeah, thanks again for listening. We will see you guys next week. Stay safe. And stay woke. <laughs>